Hi, welcome to the John E. Marlowe Guitar Series. My name is Candace Mowbray and I coordinate the pre-concert talks for the series. As a lecturer myself, I really enjoy having the chance to reach out to fellow educators, scholars, and performing artists and invite them to share their expertise with us. They give us great insights into the concert programs and deepen our knowledge and understanding of the music that's about to be performed. I'm very happy that Carl Woolwind has accepted my invitation to be our next guest speaker. I first became acquainted with Carl's work almost 10 years ago through a CD of 19th century guitar duets that he recorded with Stanley Yates. We then became friends online and I had the great opportunity to be a guest on his podcast, Guitaro Mini, which has just surpassed 60 episodes. You can read Carl's full biography at columbusclassicalguitar.com, but I would like to share with you a few highlights. Carl Wolwin performs across North America, Europe, and Asia, playing guitar in a variety of styles, which range from classical guitar to rock and roll, music theater, flamenco, jazz, and Irish music. He holds a master's degree in classical guitar performance from the Cleveland Institute of Music, where he studied with John Holmquist. He earned his Bachelor of Music degree at the University of South Carolina, where he studied with Christopher Berg. Carl has served on the faculties of several universities in the Ohio area. He's collaborated with many renowned artists and ensembles, often championing underheard repertoire and performing on both modern and historic instruments. He appears on dozens of recordings, including eight CDs with Irish bands. His solo CDs include an album of music for five course Baroque guitar and the only recording of Ferranti's Opus 11 Capricci. He's also recorded in duet with flute and also in duet with guitar with Stanley Yates, as I mentioned before. So welcome, Carl. We look forward to your lecture and thank everyone. I hope you learn a lot and that you enjoy the concert. Good evening and welcome to the Marlowe Guitar Series concert featuring Javier Hara. I'm Carl Woland. I'm a guitarist and teacher living in Columbus, Ohio. And I also host the Guitar Omni podcast. I'm delighted and honored to have been invited to speak with you this evening. Thanks, Candace, for asking me to participate, and kudos to everyone involved at Marlowe Guitar International for building such a special organization. You are all very fortunate to have this in your community. Javier has assembled quite an interesting program for this evening's performance. I'm particularly excited about it because it touches on two issues that are very near and dear to me. First off, it's a program which focuses heavily on guitar music. Perhaps this seems a strange thing to point out before a guitar concert. However, the modern approach to performance practice in the guitar world has too often suffered from a strange inferiority complex. Claiming incorrectly that the repertoire is either too small or too full of short pieces only suitable for beginners. Neither of these things is true, and guitarists often neglect the rich and vast heritage of our instrument's repertoire in favor of playing transcriptions of music by so-called major composers written for other instruments, primarily from the keyboard world. Don't get me wrong, I love playing and listening to Albanese and Bach and Scarlatti as much as the next guy, but I think it's critical that guitarists and audiences alike embrace the largely unknown repertoire written specifically for our instrument. The guitar music of the 17th and 18th centuries is virtually untouched and is full of rich and fascinating music. The second, and perhaps a more subtle thread running through this program, is meant to highlight the critical role played by the guitar in the development of historically important forms and concepts, such as the Pasakaya, its cousin the Folias, as well as other dance and variation forms. Many of the conventions that we attribute to Baroque style especially first appear in music written specifically for the guitar, and this has been unfortunately understated. Printed music for the guitar first appears in 1546, and every decade since has seen the publication of high-quality music for our instrument. 
The guitar is currently the most popular instrument on the planet. If we were to consider how much music was created for it in the 17th through the 19th century as well, we might come to believe that it was not only popular, but also important. The idea that the guitar was just a simple folk instrument until it was elevated to its proper place on the concert stage in the 20th century is a myth. And it's high time that we step out from underneath those shadows. Thanks to the technological revolutions of recent decades, we have access at our fingertips to so much music and information that used to be only available to fearless scholars who braved the labyrinth world of obscure library holdings. There is a theme present in tonight's program as well. In the liner notes from 20th Century Guitar by Julian Bream, John Warwick writes that Frank Martin was, quote, looking forward to the revival of interest in old music, not as an antiquarian study, but as a creative source. The entirety of tonight's program could be seen as a set of variations on this theme. Modern composers looking to the past, specifically to the guitar's past, for inspiration. Ponce, Martin, Barrios, Sanabria, and Rodrigo each did this in slightly different ways. The creation of this program reveals a depth of thought and artistic consideration that is matched only by Javier's profound musicianship. And I'm certain that tonight's concert will be absolutely delightful. The opening pieces by John Dowland set the stage for our exploration serving as genuine examples of, quote, the old music. The words fancy, fantasy, fantasia, or fantasia for us Americans, thank you Walt Disney, were all used to describe a piece of instrumental music which had the character of being improvised, as distinguished from dance music or an arrangement of a piece of vocal music. Dallin's highly developed examples tend to be experiments in counterpoint. Counterpoint just means music that has several independent voices operating at once. And they might be considered prototypes of the fugues that would come to be associated with instrumental music of the 18th century. Dallin wrote music for lutes with six, seven, eight, and maybe nine courses. The word course is just used to describe a string, or in this case, a pair of strings. The tuning configuration of these lutes is very similar to that of the modern guitar. With a little adjustment, we can easily play from the original sources. We call this instrument the Renaissance lute. Dowland just called it the lute. It's often mistakenly thought that the lute was an ancestor of the guitar, but actually the lute and the guitar are more like cousins, and they share a group of common ancestors. In any case, there has always been a lot of overlap between the lute and guitar worlds, and the early guitar had much in common with its older cousin. The methods of construction are similar, the techniques for playing are related, and many of the guitarists of the 16th and 17th centuries also worked as lutenists. The guitar certainly existed during Dowland's lifetime. I wonder if he ever played one. In December of 1929, Andres Segovia wrote to his friend, the Mexican composer Manuel Ponce. He said, I want you to write some brilliant variations for me on the theme of the Folias de España in D minor, and which I am sending you a copy of from a Berlin manuscript. In a style that borders between the Italian classicism of the 18th century and the dawning of German Romanticism. I will ask you this on my knees. If you do not want to sign your name to it, we will assign it to Giuliani, who, by the way, wrote a set of variations on La Folia, from whom there are many things yet to discover and from whom they have just given me a manuscript in Moscow. I want this work to be the greatest piece of that period, the counterpart of those of Corelli for violin at the same theme. Start writing variations and send them to me and try to see that they contain all the technical resources of the guitar, for example, variations with simultaneous three-note chords, in octaves, in arpeggios, rapid successions that ascend from the high B and then fall to the low D, suspensions in noble polyphonic mo motion, repeated notes, a grand cantabile that makes the beauty of the theme stand out, seen through the in ingenious weave of the variation and a return to the theme to finish with large chords, 
and after going through all the noble musical cunning of which you are capable to distract the listener from the definitive proximity to the theme. In all, 12 or 14 variations, a work for a whole section of a program, which will not be long because of the contrast of each variation with what precedes and follows it. The theme is charming. Have them play the ones by Corelli on the gramophone. If you do not remember them, you will see how it is a great sin that this theme, which oldest version is the Berlin manuscript for lute, Spanish, moreover, to the core, is exiled for the guitar, or feebly treated by Sora, which is worse. And you'll have to excuse me. Segovia didn't know what he was talking about. There were many, many examples for the guitar, and the Sora variations on La Folia are fantastic. You already know that this petition of mine is an old one, so go back to those first days of your stay in Paris. Remember? Three or four years ago, and actually a violin performance of the Corelli Variations profoundly stirred my desire to play some variations of equal or superior importance written by you. Do not refuse me now, and ask in exchange for whatever sacrifice except that of renouncing the variations. This is from the Segovia Ponce Letters, which is a very, very interesting read. Um, Ponce saved all of the letters that Segovia wrote to him, and they were published by Editions Orfe, um, edited by Miguel Alcazar, and translated by Peter Siegel. Fantastic read. Ponce agreed to write the variations, and over the next three years, with significant input from Segovia, he crafted a prelude, 20 variations on La Folia, with a fugue. Unfortunately, the prelude has been lost, but the work is published in 1932 with the theme variations and fugue is a monumental achievement. Segovia often told Ponce that the variations was his favorite work and that it was the best piece of music ever written for guitar. It clocks in at about 25 minutes, but I assure you that Javier's engaging performance of this piece will seem like it's past in the blink of an eye. La Folia de España Loosely translated as the Spanish folly or foolishness is a remarkable grain of sand that persisted through 500 years of inspiration to be used as the basis for compositions by over 150 composers. Its earliest mention describes something performed as music in the theater, strummed by guitarists as incidental music. The guitar enjoyed its first, quote, golden age in the 17th century with well over 300 known sources of published, that's printed music, not including the hundreds of pieces available from manuscript or unpublished sources. Around 1600, the guitar took this shape, which it was to have for nearly 200 years. The instruments analogous to the modern instrument tuned like our five highest strings, that is A, D, G, B, and E, there are octave differences for the two lowest strings, depending on time and location, and strumming was a heavy part of the technique until about the mid-18th century. The instrument was hugely popular in Italy, France, and Spain especially, and most of the guitar books from this time include examples of variations on La Folia. It is a chord progression that goes like this. Maybe you recognize it. I like to say that it's one of those things like the 12 bar blues progression or the chord changes from George Gershwin's I Got Rhythm that everyone knows even if they don't know that they know it because it has been so present for so long that it has seeped into our collective mind. Frank Martin wrote the four short pieces in 1933 and he dedicated them to Segovia. Segovia never played this fine work, and we can only speculate as to the reasons for this. Thankfully, Julian Bream took up the piece and recorded it in 1967. Martin's highly personal style merges sensibilities of neoclassicism with modernist procedures modified from the second Viennese school that we associate with the serial compositions of Arnold Schoenberg, Anton Webern, and Alban Berg. Martin's music is tonal, but not in any kind of conventional way, 
and he sometimes uses techniques more often associated with atonal procedures. This piece is cast in the mold of a suite, complete with the requisite prelude and concluding jig, or jig. A suite is merely a collection of pieces, usually dances, often presented in the same key. The dance suite, sometimes called a sonata or partita, is one of the defining forms in Baroque instrumental music. The cello suites of Johann Sebastian Bach, which are often played by guitarists in transcription, are the typical example of this. Some of the earliest pieces with the title Prelude are found in early guitar sources, and the idea of collecting a suite of dances evolved in music written for the guitar as well. Martin's two inner movements, air and planta, are reminiscent of 17th century music of the French court. Air is a term used to describe a lyrical or melodic piece, and a planta is a cry of grief used in mourning. The next set of pieces, written by the Paraguayan guitarist Agustin Barrios Mangoré, represents a different kind of looking to the past for inspiration. His respect for the music of the giants of European classical music compelled him to write music in a somewhat anachronistic style. Rather than adopting modernism, Barrios chose a similar approach to that of the pianist Sergei Rachmaninoff, continuing a romantic tradition established in the 19th century. Barrios is a fascinating character. He is one of the first guitarists to record, and he toured extensively in South America. He was of indigenous Guarani descent. In a move to revive his somewhat flagging career, he performed concerts under the name Nitsuga Mangore. In these concerts, he wore traditional dress and he included scenic elements and poetry. Nitsuga is his first name spelled backwards and he took the name Mangore, who was a legendary chieftain of the Guarani people. Barrios performed in Europe in 1934 and 35, and he even played on the radio in Germany, which caused quite an uproar with the Nazi media censors. In a stroke of bad timing, he then went to Spain, which was in the midst of its civil war. Barrios died in El Salvador in 1944, and he was nearly forgotten about until Richard Stover was able to collect and publish his music in the early 1970s. Stover collaborated with John Williams, who lit the world on fire with his 1977 recording, John Williams Plays Music of Agustin Barrios Mangore. Barrios' music is now extremely popular amongst performers and audiences alike. The two preludes Javier is playing tonight are examples of Barrios looking to J.S. Bach for inspiration, and the Mazurka is influenced by Frederick Chopin. I find that all of his music seems to be imbued with the spirit of South American folk idiom, whether it's just under the surface in a discreet fashion or direct in both name and style, as it is in the case of this Mashisha. Mashisha is the name of a ballroom dance from Brazil. Barrios wrote over 300 works, making him one of our most prolific composers. The Spanish composer Joaquin Rodrigo is, of course, best known for his Concierto de Aaron Wess. He also wrote four other guitar concertos and at least 20 solo pieces for our instrument, including these three Spanish pieces from 1954. To connect more threads through this evening performance, Rodrigo and Ponce met one another and Segovia in Paris in the 1920s. The composers were both students of Paul Ducat who is the composer of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which we know today mostly because of the Walt Disney film Fantasia. Anyway, the second movement of the three Spanish pieces, the Pasacaya, is another example of a modern composer diving into the deep waters of the guitar's past. In a similar fashion to the aforementioned La Folia, the Pasacaya first appears in reports of pieces played by strumming guitarists as diversions for theatrical or literary works in the 16th century. Examples of Pasacaya exist in almost every source of guitar music from the 17th century, and the Pasacaya is very widely in scope from just simple chord progressions used as teaching pieces, all the way up to the highly sophisticated works of one Bolognese guitarist and my personal musicological hero, Angelo Michele Bartolotti. 
Most Pasacayas are variations on a repeated bass line, and Rodrigo's example follows this format. The third piece in the set, Zapateado, takes its name from the Spanish word for shoe, zapata, and it is an Andalusian folk dance. It features a two-beat rhythmic scheme with each beat divided into threes. So that's a two-beat scheme, one, two, one, two, each beat dividing in, being divided into threes, one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three. And in a zapateado, there is a stress on the second beat. So you get one, two, three, two, two, three, two, three, two, two, three, two, two, three. So listen for that in tonight's performance. The word zapateado is also used as a generic term in flamenco music to describe footwork. Before performing the Rodrigo, Javier will present a work written especially for him by a living Mexican composer, Arturo Martinez Sanabria. In Javier's own words, quote, Arturo wrote the piece after hearing me play the Ponce variations. Instead of ending the variations in a fugue, it ends in a pasacaya that references Rodrigo's pasacaya. So he's paying homage to both Ponce and Rodrigo in this piece. I hope that you all enjoyed tonight's concert. I have no doubt that you're in for a real treat. Javier is a tremendous musician. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your interest in our wonderful instrument, and also for your support of the Marlowe Guitar Series.